Broadcasting from the Golden Spread of Texas, this is The Fred Hughes Show. With each episode, we introduce to you an inspiring person or message to help you grow and unlock your potential in life. I'm Fred Hughes, professional photographer, pastor, teacher, author, and your show host. Thank you for joining us, and welcome to this episode brought to you by the Faithful Partners of Decision Ministry. Okay, well, this is Fred Hughes, and welcome this afternoon uh, to um, our regular meeting that we have on Thursday, and I just um, hope that everybody's uh, kind of logging in and and connecting up because they have an exciting guest that I want to uh, present to you tonight. Uh, Before we get rolling, I just want to remind you that Decision Ministries International, that's Irene and I, and we've been, uh, uh, you can go to our website at www.decision1.org. The word decision, the numeral one, and then the extension ORG. So check that out. We can, um, we have a lot of teachings. We have all kinds of things available to you there. Uh, and back in the back of that, uh, there's a little button that you can click on. Ministry is free, but uh, getting it to where it needs to go sometimes costs some money. So uh, click on that little button and uh, join us as partners. Uh, Put yourself into play with uh, the minister that we have and be blessed. Receive receive and give is what uh, the Bible kind of teaches us to do. If we, if we're, if we get good things, we should be able to give good things. And so I'd encourage you to uh, plug in with us as, and, and support us. We support lots of different ministries all around the world. And uh, we're going to have several of those people on from time to time. So I'm excited about all of that. I'll remind you that uh, I've written a little book it's called Mr. Fred's Box. And if you go to the website, there's a little uh, click in uh, that you can find and order the box. Uh, you can go to uh, directly to Amazon and order it. But uh, if you go to the website, it'll click you uh, straight through and it's a little easier to get there. Uh, also, I want to remind you that we have a um, on duty uh, group of people that are standing by, willing and able to minister to you tonight, uh, pray with you, answer questions that you might have. Um, they're all spirit filled people that know Jesus and can, and are full of the word of God. So if you have a need, if you just have some prayer that you would like, you want someone to just get into agreement with you. And, um, we have these folks that are available and I just, uh, let me give you a phone number. It's unfortunately, if you're watching uh, from overseas, we don't have that numbers not available, but, uh, if you're in the, United States, area code 806-338-2929. Area code 806-338-2929. And they will be glad to pray with you and help you and minister to you. Um, there's, they might even prophesy over you. They're, they're going to encourage you in some way. So write that number down and use, utilize it as you go along. Uh, next week, I want to just tell you that my guest is going to be Ramon Cobos. He is uh, one of my main guys in Mexico. When I go down and we do things in Mexico, well, Ramon is going to be there. And uh, he is an awesome man of God. He'll have a great word for you. And you'll be excited to hear all of the things that are going on. There's just some really cool uh, things happening in Mexico. So as bad as bad as many bad things are going on, well, I just tell you, there's a lot of good things going on in Mexico as well. And you can have a report about that uh, this coming week, next coming Thursday. I'll be speaking the next Thursday remotely, going to go down and take care of some grandbabies and have fun. And so I'm going to be doing that meeting. And the meeting after that is um, a dear friend of mine called, his name is Steve Beatty. And I guarantee you, he's, he's a man of God. He's going to, he'll bring you something. If you're a farmer, rancher, anything to do with agriculture, you want to chime in that week. So anyway, we're excited about good things that are going on. And most of all, I'm excited about what's going to happen tonight. And so I just, tonight I want to 
Uh, my guest is is just a really special friend of mine. Uh, I, we've been around for a long time together, off and on, but uh, very special. He's a mentor for many years for me personally and for many, many others, Pastor David Brown. And um, we, Pastor David, how are you? I'm good, Fred. Thank you. Glad to be with you tonight. Well, I'm kind of excited about it myself. I, I was I was kind of going over it back in 1991. You and I uh, were at this in the same uh, activities together in Saltillo, Mexico, and I think that uh, I had met you from a distance, but I think that's the first time I had had opportunity to spend time with you and really get to know you. That's been a while back. And then I went to uh, Honduras with you in 2007. Mm -hmm. And so those were exciting trips and exciting times together. So we go back a ways. Yeah, well, you know, if you live long enough, (laughs) (laughs) you know, as they say, if you live long enough, yeah, yeah. you you're going to have a lot of experiences with a lot of people. I I appreciate my times with you. Well, before we get too far along, I always like to um, get people, have people to uh, be able to get a hold of you and and contact your ministry and connect up. So if you would just uh, share your, your, uh, some way that people could connect with you or get a hold of you or tune into what you've got going on. Sure. Well, of course, we're on social media, uh, Pastor David Brown on Facebook and uh, uh, Pastor David Brown one on Instagram. I have a a relatively new website for my new ministry that we just uh, began this this past year. Our website is davidbrownministries.org, davidbrownministries.org. And uh, you can go there and go to all of our social media and our uh, YouTube account. And I'm Pastor David Brown on YouTube. Now, there may, there's several David Browns in ministry around the country. But, hey, you'll recognize my face. You'll, you'll find me there. Pastor David Brown on YouTube. And I've got, uh, uh, of course, teaching videos, uh, sermon videos on, on the YouTube channel. So there's the quickest ways to see what we're doing nowadays. You have a brand new book. It's called Celebrating the Healing Power of God. I and I just want to put a little plug in for that. Tell us about that book. Yeah. In fact, I've got one laying here. Let me show you a picture of it there. There it is. Celebrating awesome. the Healing Power of God. Uh, it's available on Amazon. You can go to Amazon and just type in Celebrating the Healing Power of God or Pastor David Brown. And you'll come up with it. And uh, it's 123 pages. This book. Uh, let me talk to you a little bit about this book. I uh, put a lot of work into it uh, over a number of years. We, uh, uh, several years ago, we, I wrote three books to give away to all of our attendees in our crusades in Honduras. I wrote a book on the new birth, a, a book on the church, the importance of the church in a Christian's life, and then this one on the healing power of God. And uh, so we gave away scores of thousands of copies of a hundred thousand plus copies of these books in our crusades down there. And, uh, so two years ago, I, I, this has never been printed in English. None of those three had had ever been printed in English. So two years ago, I went in, re-edited this book and, um, expanded it and, um, uh, got it ready to print in English. So we just brought it out this past year, just six months ago or so. And uh, so it's available on Amazon. And of course, I carry it with me to my meetings. And uh, uh, I would ask people not to try to order it from me personally. I, I'm not selling anything per- except in my meetings. Uh, but the quickest and the cheapest way they can get it is just go to Amazon. But it is a basically a, a primer on the concept, the doctrine of divine healing. Um, it, it's, it's simple. It's not deep. It's a, by the way, it's a great gift to give someone who's battling a disease because it starts from the beginning point and helps them to understand that God is a healing God, that Jesus wants to heal them. Uh, I've got a chapter on who will God heal, a chapter on why some people are not healed. I've got a chapter on um, the author of sickness. Where does sickness come from? 
and all of the real basic fundamental issues that have to do with healing uh, to build a person's faith in, in our good God who does heal the sick. And so uh, that's out there for you and, and uh, hope people get a hold of it because I believe it'll build their faith, get them in line for a miracle. There you go. One of the lines that uh, I so appreciate, and this shows you Pastor David's heart, it just says, it is my goal to make every Christian meeting or service that I conduct a celebration of God's goodness. Man, yeah. I love it. Amen. And that is, it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Yes, sir. And having been present when Pastor David has spoken in both uh, many places, uh, we, I, I, that's his heart. That's, that's generally been his heart all the way through. And he, he never loses sight of the value of, a, of, of somebody being born again. And so pastor David there, I mean, sometimes I see you and as a pastor and sometimes I see you as an evangelist and I, you're both. And so share a little bit about that because I think there's a lot of Christians don't really realize that there's multiple callings, that there's multiple things. God's not limited with us, is he at all? Oh, no, no, God is unlimited. We're the only ones that limit God and the things of God. You know, the truth is, Fred, um, all of us are more gifted than we give God credit for. We all have gifts and uh, multiple gifts and uh I think it'd be a mistake to try to, you know, reduce it down to just one. My gift is just this one thing. Uh, no, we're we, we're all a little more, more complex than that. Uh, the question has been raised, though, uh, in ministry. You know, we, we, we've been taught. We know that there are five primary ministry offices for elders in the body of Christ. Ministry offices, the uh, mm-hmm. apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, five of the office of the leaders of the church of, of Jesus. And uh, so oftentimes some people, uh, people will think oh, this person is an evangelist. That's just what they are. They're just a pastor. They're a teacher. Well, you know, first of all, Jesus stood in all five offices. He, he was the great apostle of our faith. He's a, he was a prophet. He was certainly a shepherd, a pastor. He's a teacher. Uh, and he was a soul winning evangelist. Of course, we're not Jesus, but uh, I'll name the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul uh, claimed that he was a teacher and that he was a prophet. And of course, we know he was an apostle. And um, well, I can think of one particular place in the book of Acts where he stayed in one city for two years teaching and actually pastoring people. So he, he stood in multiple offices. So the, it's not true of everyone, but the truth is I, it's been a balancing act for me for many years. I'm, I, I have been a pastor. And uh, I think my, my office gift has been pastor and evangelist. I have two offices that I function in from time to time. Uh, and then I have a motivational gift of teaching. So uh, all that's mixed up to make me a unique person, just like your gifts would be mixed together by the Holy Spirit to make you a very unique uh, person and utensil for God to use in his kingdom. Um, you know, it's interesting. If I, if I was in the church for too long and not able to do a, a campaign or to get out into another country, I'd get frustrated. I'd want to go win souls, you know, and then if, and I'd go down to Honduras and spend 10 days, do three cities in a row. And man, I'd be hungry to get back to the church and just sit back and teach and disciple people. So uh, it's just two big, two big passions for me, you know, and and that's what it's all about. A person needs to follow their passion, that God-given passion that's in them. Yeah, yeah I, I believe that that's correct. And I mean, it, to me, it, I mean, for a lot of different people, uh, God calls you. And, and sometimes I think it's different seasons, you know, that uh, mm-hmm. he will He will raise, raise you up and use certain gifts and, and have you to flow in a certain way. And then other seasons, I get a little tangled up with the tags that people, you know, there are those all fivefold ministries and, and the offices and it, those are all very real and very, you know, good deal. But I, I, I get uh, a little bit frustrated with, with, with the tag, you know, uh, tagging everybody uh, with, with those things because God can use you. Um, sure. You know, no matter where you, if he can use a donkey, he can use Fred Hughes, you know, and so, 
The truth is, and many sometimes people, he actually does. So. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is, many people mistag themselves. Yes, uh, they don't really understand the offices uh, to a great degree sometimes. And but and you know, it's not important. No, I don't know that that's important. The Bible's describing the different forms of leadership ministry. Right. What's important is that we have our hearts filled with what God wants us to know and that we empty that heart into other people. Yeah. Who to, who cares if a person is a prophet or a teacher, you yeah. know? Yeah. yeah. Well, I can tell you that uh, pastor David, whenever he's finished on a platform, he's always going to bring healing into the picture somehow or another. And that's, uh, I would really encourage you to go and get his book because it's uh, it, he's, he's a really good teacher in that particular realm. Um, there's, and, and that's, my friend is not an April fool. That is a, an April invite to, to, to buy a good book. So go and avail yourself of that because it's good. Um, I talked to uh, Tony Poole the other day, just uh, Pastor David, because and, and he was he was he was wanting me to change uh, days so that he could be the April fool. But <laughs> <laughs> oh my. I think he's watching us tonight. He told me he's going to be watching. So you, yeah, you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, if, if he if he uh, gets there, well, well, he'll probably make some kind of comments or whatever. Also on Pastor David's um, uh, website, there's um, this is a Bible stories and Bible story two. Uh, those are really, I mean, there's some awesome things at his website. So I would encourage you to go back over and do this. David Brown Ministries with the IES on the end, dot O-R-G, just to remind you. Pastor David, I want to uh, flip a button here and take me off of the screen and just let you share your heart tonight because uh, I'm, I, I, I could visit with you all night, but uh, I really know that God has something for uh, the group tonight, and I want you to have your liberty with it. And uh, so I'm going to... Uh, uh, I think change the screen to where they if I can figure out how to do it exactly. Um, and if I can't, don't worry about it. Look at him, not at me. So, uh, well, I'm hung up here. I'm not real sure about that. Anyway, I'm going to just turn it over to you, Pastor David, and if you would uh, just share your heart with us and, um, and we'll listen in. I'm ready to take notes, and I hope you guys are too. All right. Thank you, Fred. I appreciate the opportunity, and everyone that's tuned in and, and uh, viewing tonight, we welcome you. We're, we're glad that you're here. Um, I, uh, we're at, of course, we're in Holy Week. We, we, uh, Easter Sunday, our Resurrection Sunday is coming up this Lord's Day, this weekend. And uh, so I thought to myself as I prayed about what to share tonight, I thought, uh, Wow, I've, I've, I've got to, I've, I've just, I feel compelled. We've got to talk about what happened at the cross. Now, uh, before, before I go any further, please don't think you know all about that because I'm telling you the Bible, the word of God is crammed at full of revelation. And, uh, and I, I, this, this subject of what Jesus accomplished on the cross is number one, paramount in importance. Number two, misunderstood by so many people. And number three, not even those of us who are saved, who are in the body of Christ, really have never uh, understood it in the depth that I know God wants us to understand it. So I'm hoping and believe in God and through my study that we can bring some fresh revelation and some new thoughts to you tonight uh, about the cross. Before I begin to say that, uh, to talk about that, though, uh, let me share this. You know, the, the Bible's a big book. Uh, I remember growing up, some people would tell me, you know, it's just impossible to understand the Bible. I mean, nobody understands the Bible. I don't, I don't believe that at all. I believe the Bible can be understood, but there are keys. There are rules of Bible interpretation that we're most of us acquainted with. Uh, but but I've learned that there are certain words in the Bible that are key to unlocking its revelation. Let me share six words that we'll see all through the scripture that really unlock the Bible story, that unlock the revelation of God that he intends for us to receive. Six words that unlock 
the story of the Bible. Those words are these, good and evil. Those are the first two, good and evil. You'll see those words all through the scripture. It's important to note them. It's, un, it's important to know what God is saying when he talks about good and he talks about evil. The next two words, life and death, life and death. And then finally, these words, blessing and cursing. Those six words unlock so much of the Bible and are, uh, and are so very important to understand what Jesus accomplished on the cross. Good and evil, life and death, blessing and cursing. And then there's a principle in the Bible that's very important for us to get, because even though we might understand the Bible, we can't make it work for us unless we understand this principle taught all through scripture, the principle of choice, choice. Now, it's interesting that there's a passage of scripture where all six of those key words are mentioned, and that principle of choice is taught. It's found in Deuteronomy chapter 30. If you have a Bible, you might want to turn open in your Bible, but let me read these four or five verses here. We'll find all of these words in that principle of choice in the scripture. God was addressing the children of Israel, his people, and he said these words, starting with Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. He says, see, I have set before you this day life and good, death and evil. There's four of the words right there. I've set before you, he says, life and good, death and evil. And I command you this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgments, that you may live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless you in the land where you go to possess it. But if your heart turn away so that you will not hear, but shall be drawn away and worship other gods and serve them. I denounce unto you this day that you shall surely perish and that you shall not prolong your days upon the land where you pass over Jordan to go to possess it. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and blessing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your seed may live. I want to read that verse again. He says, I call heaven and earth to witness this day against you. I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your seed may live. And so we see there's a connection with all these six words. Good and life and blessing is what God offers the human race. Evil and death and cursing is another choice that humankind can make. But it boils down to our choices, our choice of what kind of life we're going to live. And then one other thing out of that passage that I want to bring to your attention, uh, all of that surrounds this one commandment. He says, what I want you to do is I want you to love the Lord. Love the Lord, your God. Uh, God wants to be loved he created humankind to have a person to love and in expectation that humans would love him back. And uh, really, that's what the cross is all about. So I want to talk to you about what happened at the cross, understanding what was accomplished at the cross. But it's important to know that you'll never be able to understand what happened at the cross unless you First, understand what happened at, in the garden. <laughs> you know, we, we're not just given a New Testament with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and just the, the, our favorite scripture, John 3, 16. No, we've got a whole big book, and it begins with a book called Genesis, which means the beginnings, the beginnings. So what I want to do is take you all the way back to the beginning, and in the book of Genesis, and we must talk about what happened in the garden if we're going to understand what happened at the cross. Well, Genesis 1 and verse 1, now don't be afraid. I'm not, I can't teach the whole Bible tonight, I, although I'm going to start in Genesis, but this is so key. In fact, this is why Satan has attacked Genesis. This is why 
uh, the teaching and the concept of evolution is so dangerous to believers today because Satan wishes to, 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 to extract our faith in the word of God from our hearts by denouncing and uh, attacking the veracity, the authority, the truth of the book of Genesis. You know, really think about it. If we can't believe Genesis, how can we believe any of the rest of the Bible? Uh, I believe the devil is pulling the rug out from under people's lives when he robs us of Genesis. Genesis is absolutely vital to our understanding of God, our understanding of life, and certainly our understanding of what Jesus did at the cross. So we're going all the way back to Genesis. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning, God in the beginning is God. We start with God. This is where life starts. This is where existence starts. This is where everything starts. God pre-existed everything else, all of creation. He created everything. So everything and everyone owes their, ex- their very existence to God. Now, the Bible says that the, in the Psalms, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything that's created is God's. It's his creation. It's, he's the owner. It's his. This life that we're living, it's not our life. It's his life given to us. Uh, this life, when you take a breath and are born into this world, you have just been named as a steward or a manager of God's precious gift of life. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity that God wants you to use in love toward him. See, that's the first and great commandment, to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul. Amen. And so God God has created us, given us life, in order that we can return his love and his opportunity by us giving him our love and the opportunity to use us in a way that glorifies him, that, uh, that elevates him. And in our elevation, elevating of God, then we are elevated ourselves. That's how we are going to be blessed. Now, notice that these words just keep flowing through biblical revelation, life, good, and blessing. Uh, this is the way God set everything up. Now, let's think about creation. If you read the first chapter of Genesis, you'll see that, that, that it begins with God creating or allowing light to be spread throughout the universe. The Bible says God is light. When he said, let there be light, I don't know that he was creating light as much as he was expressing light. The light that was within him was scattered through all the universe and all creation. And that's why the Bible says that the stars in the heaven tell us of the glory of God. It is the glory of God. It, it, it was, every star in our heavens was sparked by the light that came from the heart of God. When he said, light be, and it's this, this is the Hebrew and light was. But God, uh, let that light be spread throughout the universe. And then it says that God saw the light and he saw that it was good. There's that word good. Uh, Then it says that he separated the earth and the seas from one another and he saw that they were good. He made the vegetation. He created the fruit trees, the seeds of the fruit. He saw that that was good. Uh, He created the sun to rule our earth by day and the moon to rule by night and the stars in the heavens. And he saw that they were good. Genesis first chapter says, then he created then the animal life and he saw that that was good. And then he wraps up toward the end of the chapter by saying that he created man, Adam. He created Adam from the very dust of the earth. And the Bible says that Adam was made in the very image of God. Now, I want to remind you that God, the Bible says, is good. That's right. God is good. And the Bible says that in uh, verse, chapter 1, verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. He says it twice. He's emphasizing. And then he says it a third time. Male and female created he them. So both male and female are created in the very image of God, made to look like God. We are like God. We are God-like, not gods, but God-like creations. And uh, we, 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 like God, uh, are spirit and soul and body. We are spiritual in nature. God is a spirit. You and I are spirits. 
We have souls, our intellect, our mind, our will, our emotions. God has emotions. God has a will. You see, we're like God in that. And, and even physically, I believe we're physically made to look like God. So many people think that God's a puff of smoke or just a ball of fire or some impersonal force. No, no, no. God's a person. And you and I look like him. That's right. We're made in the image of God. Now, if we're made in the image of God, then that means Adam and Eve were created good because God is good. God is light. There's no darkness in him. He's good. There's no evil in him. So Adam and Eve were created to be, and they were like God. Now in chapter one and verse 28, the Bible says this, God blessed them, Adam and Eve. And he said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the sea and the fowl of the air and every living thing that moves upon the earth. So God blessed Adam and Eve. That word blessed means to be benefited. There's one of the words again. Remember the words, good, evil, life, death, blessing, cursing. And so God is blessed. He's blessing them. He's benefiting them. He then tells them to be fruitful, to be productive, to multiply and to replenish the earth or literally to make the earth plentiful with their kind What kind are they? They're the good kind. Adam and Eve were good. They were like God. God's vision, dream, if you will, was that the earth be filled with people like you and me, people, though, in the image of God, like God. God wanted earth to be filled with reflection of himself. Or I say it like this, God wanted the world to be filled with God likeness. That's right. God reflected in people's lives. And uh, so he wants us, he, he wanted us to fill the earth with God likeness. By the way, in the New Testament, the Great Commission, go into all the world and preach the gospel. God's still after the same thing. He wants God likeness all around the world, saturating every life. He told them to subdue the earth. The word subdue there is a very interesting word. I'm still teaching out of verse 28. He says, subdue the earth. That word subdue means to tread it down. Like you'd, you'd go out in your yard and just walk all over it because it's yours. Tread it down, conquer it, subjugate it, violate it, bring it into bondage. You see, God gave mankind a great power over creation itself, a great authority. He gave us this world to be utilized. He gave us this world to tread down, to conquer it, to subjugate it, to even violate it. It's to serve you and I. This earth is to serve us. We're to bring it into bondage, tame it, use it. It's for us. It's a part of our lives. It's a God's gift to us. It's our home planet. We're to live on this planet and take care of it. Then he says, I I give you dominion over, over everything, over the sea, over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over every living thing, all of the animal life. And that word dominion means to rule, reign, take, or subjugate. In other words, he gave mankind full authority over the earth, all over everything attached to the earth, everything roaming the earth. Everything was placed under Adam's authority. You have to understand this. Everything was, now the earth is the Lord's, God owns it, but Adam was made the steward over it. Adam and Eve were to be the managers of this planet. They and their children and their children's children and their children's children's children. And as we multiply, we were to run all over the world, eating what we needed, bearing fruit, productive, bringing glory to God. That's the original vision of God. Uh, In verse 29, there's something very interesting. This is Genesis 1:29, And God said, behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of the whole earth and every tree in which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you. It should be for food. So we've gotten the idea that God g- gave Adam a garden. No, no, no. He gave him a planet. The garden was just his home base. He didn't just have the trees in the garden. God gave Adam and Eve every tree in this whole entire world, 
every tree. And as the human family was, was to expand and populate this planet, all the land masses of this planet, there would be fruit trees there to provide for them. You know, the word provision means to see before, to have vision before God made provision for human humanity. Even before humanity was here, he created the plant life and the fruit trees before he created mankind. God already saw that we had needs and he provided for us. Don't doubt that God will provide your needs. He has seen before what you're going to need. And if you'll move in the will of God, you'll find your fruit trees are right where God sends you to bring forth God likeness. That's, that's, that's God's plan in our lives. So he gives Adam and Eve the fruits, all the seeds in the fruit. And Adam and his family were to tread down the world, uh, eat the fruit, exercise dominion, bringing glory to God. Now, I want you to think about all the things that God gave Adam and Eve. I've made a whole list here. Just want to share with you some of these things. Uh, We see that he's given them blessing, the blessing, the, the benefits of his provision, his partnership, his principles, for instance, we, we, we know a little bit about the seed time and harvest principle and seed time and harvest is to continue through all the days of, the, uh, of earth. Uh, well, that's a principle. It's, it's a physical thing. God gave us seeds, but it's also a principle. Your words are seeds. Your kindness is a seed. Whatever we do or say or do toward others it, are seeds planted. So seeds were given to Adam. Physical seeds, plant seeds. Uh, seeds were given to Adam. Uh, but also the principle of the seed. God gave Adam a mandate to fill the earth with God likeness. He gave him abundant possessions and fruitfulness. God gave Adam a beautiful home, the garden of Eden. By the way, the word Eden means pleasure, a garden of pleasure. God wanted life to be pleasurable for humankind. He gave Adam everything he would need to be productive. Think about it. He gave him soil. He gave him sunshine and he gave him seed. Chapter two, Genesis two, verse eight says that God, not not God made a garden, not God established a garden, but God planted a garden. He seeded that garden. He put the seeds in the ground. And then he also gave Adam water. In fact, the Bible says in the second chapter there that there was a river that came out of Eden and it split into four different streams. Let me give you the four streams. Uh, Pishon. Uh, which, by the way, means increase. Think about the word, meaning many of these words. Gion, a, the, a river called Gion, which means bursting forth. Hidekel, that's the Tigris. We know that is the Tigris River. But Hidekel means rapid. And then the Euphrates. Euphrates means fruitfulness. Think about these four rivers that came out of Eden. Increase, bursting forth, rapid, and fruitfulness. Let me tell you something. God taught from the beginning, from the book of beginnings, from the Garden of Eden, that he wanted to increase us, burst forth for us. He wants it to be rapid. He wants your life to be fruitful. Let's not doubt that God wants to do great things in our lives. Well, he gave Adam a purpose to work and to guard that garden paradise. In fact, he gave Adam a job here, this work of keeping the garden before he gave him a wife. I like to tell young ladies, Before you marry a man, make sure he's got a job first. That's right. Adam had a job before he had a wife. Uh, He gave Adam a great creative mentality. Adam was able with his own mind to create names for every animal on the planet. Can you imagine the mentality of Adam? Then God gave Adam a wife, a helper fit for him. Then he gave Adam and Eve a test. He gave him so many things, but he also gave him a test of love and trust. Adam, God was saying, I want you to love me. I want you to trust me. I want a partner in life with you. I want you to respond to me correctly. And he says, the way I'm going to allow you to, to, to show me that you love me and that you trust me is I'm giving you all these trees. Now, remember, he gave him all the trees, not of the garden, but of the whole world. Then he says, I'm going to plant one tree in the middle of the garden. He called it the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's two of those words again. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he, and he says, I, I don't want you to eat of that tree. Don't eat of that tree. And that's a special tree. That's a forbidden tree. And uh, Adam, 
listen, I've given you all this pleasure. I've given you all of this potential. I've given you this beautiful wife. By the way, I believe she was beautiful. I believe he was handsome. They were made in the image of God. They were good. They looked good. They felt good. They were strong and they were beautiful. And so he's so blessed, so benefited. God says, I want you to give one thing back. I I want you to leave that one tree alone. Don't eat of that fruit. And then he gave Adam a warning. Don't eat of that, the fruit of that tree, because the day you eat of that fruit of that tree, you shall surely die. Now, so many people translate that statement as a threat. In other words, they have God saying, don't eat of this tree. And if you do, I'm going to kill you. That's not what God said. Not, that's not what God said at all. He said, there's one unique tree that I want you to leave it alone. And by leaving it alone, you, you'll, 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 I'll know that you trust me, that you care about me, that you love me. You see, that tree has ne- will have a negative effect. If you eat of that tree, you will die. That day, you will die. That tree will kill you. I'm not going to kill you. The tree will kill you. I'm not going to kill you, what God was saying. You'll kill yourself. You'll commit suicide right there. Don't eat of that tree. Now, can you see all, all Adam had to do was trust what God said. Just believe it. God is a faith God. He wants faith from us. That's what pleases the heart of God, to be loved and trusted. And so God wasn't giving Adam a threat. He was giving him a loving warning. Please, Adam, don't eat of that tree. Don't eat of that one. You've got all of these other trees. You can eat of them all you want. All your pleasure. Take everything you want. Tread down the earth. Do whatever you want. You, you, and, you and Eve have one little rule. Just don't eat of that one tree. That's a special tree. That tree will be bad news. You don't want anything to do with that tree. And that brings us now to chapter three. And I would like to read through some of the text of chapter three. Chapter three, verse one. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Notice what what the devil does. He's speaking through the serpent. He said, he said, I don't believe a, a snake can talk. So you see that right there is why I don't believe Genesis. No, right there is where, where you, you need to see the consistency of scripture. Uh, there was another talking animal in the Bible. It was uh, Balaam's donkey. Later on, we read about Balaam's donkey. The Bible says specifically that God loosed his tongue and the, and, the, and the donkey spoke to Balaam, the prophet. It's very similar to another story in the New Testament where Jesus loosed a man's tongue. And though he'd been mute, he began to speak. I personally, you know, there's animals in heaven. I don't know if your pets will go or not, but there's horses there. There's animals in heaven. And I personally believe they'll be talking animals. I personally believe the animals talked back in that day. The snake talked. A donkey later talked. Wouldn't that be wonderful? We get to heaven. We get to talk to animals. I'm telling you, the Bible is better than anything, any movie you've ever watched, any sci-fi thing you've read about. Listen, I'm telling you, the Bible is intriguing. Heaven's going to be awesome. And I'm telling you, God is an amazing person. We, we, we need to fall in love with him. So, so yes, this serpent was talking. And he said, yea, hath God said, you shall not eat of every... Notice how negative he turned it negative. Well, I've heard that God's withholding from you, that there's one of the trees that he won't let you eat. Now, he didn't mention all of the millions of trees they could eat from. He, he, he focuses on the thing that God says, please leave that alone because it'll hurt you. It'll kill you. He says, I've heard you can't eat of every tree. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God has said, you will not eat of it. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. Now she added some to it there. Neither shall you touch it. God said he couldn't touch it. He didn't say you couldn't touch it. He just said, don't eat of it. Well, she got it secondhand. That command came before Eve was created, in fact. So she had heard that from Adam, but she, you know, like many of us today, she stretched it a little bit. Now she added to it a little bit. You know, the Bible says uh, that it's not good to add to or take away from the word of God. In fact, there's a curse will come to people. What's, the, what's curse mean? It means the lack of benefit. It's simple. Blessing is benefit. 
cursing is to be without the benefit of God. We don't want to live life without God's benefit, without God's grace. So he's, so she said, well, he told us not to eat of it nor, nor touch it lest we die. Well, the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Now he directly contradicts what God said. He sows a seed of contradiction of unbelief. He says, God knows in the day that you eat thereof, then your eyes will be open and you'll be like as gods or literally in the Hebrew, like God, knowing good and evil. There's two of those words, good and evil. You'll know good. You'll be like God. You'll know good and evil. Well, can I tell you something? God didn't want mankind to know good and evil. He just wanted us to know good. He never wanted us to experience good and evil. He just wanted us to experience good. God is good. Everything he created was good. Adam and Eve were good. It was a good life. It was a good paradise. It was a good existence. Everything was good. He just wanted us to understand that he's good, that he's given us good, that we're good, and that we need to remain in the goodness of God and trust him for that and believe him for that and love him because of his goodness. Well, uh, this is a lie. He says, he said, he pro- this is such an empty promise. He, I heard a minister say this last weekend. He promised her nothing because he said, yeah, eat of the tree and you'll be like, God. no, they were already like God. They were already like God and they didn't know, need to know good and evil. Like God knew good and evil. He knew about it. He had already encountered Lucifer's rebellion. He understood what evil was capable of doing, but they they had no idea. All they had to do was trust God. Well, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise, here's a mistake. She's focusing on that, which is forbidden. Don't, Don't focus on what's forbidden. Focus on the goodness of God. That's how you live life. If you focus on what's forbidden, it's going to lead you astray. Uh, By the way, this woman was faced with the three major temptations in life. John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, I think, he said, all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. All sin, all disobedience falls in those three categories. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. She was faced with all three. Watch this. She saw that the tree was good for food. Yummy. That looks good. That's lust of the flesh. It was pleasant to the eyes. It was beautiful. Lust of the eyes. It was desired to make one wise. Oh, boy. If she was smart as God, wouldn't she be proud? Pride of life. When she succumbed to those three temptations, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her He should have been resisting the devil. He should have been protecting her, but he was right there with her and he did eat. Then the eyes of them both were opened and they knew that they were naked. Big revelation, huh? Wow. What did it do for them? All it did was expose their nakedness. And of course, immediately embarrassment or shame set in. Then they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons or coverings. Mankind has been doing that ever ever since. We try to cover our own sin with something we've produced ourselves. It never works. We try to alleviate our sense of shame by covering ourselves. It never works. Then, Then it says, and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Many people conjecture that God would come down every day and fellowship with them. Perhaps that's true. He certainly came this day looking for fellowship. Adam and his wife, though, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. Notice that God comes looking for Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve are running away from God. Always remember this. Sin does not separate God from you. He still loves you. He still chases you. He still pursues you. He still wants you. Sin doesn't separate God from you. Separate God. Sin separates you from God. That's the issue. So he comes searching Adam. The Lord God called unto him, Adam, where art thou? That's, that's, that's still the question God's asking of every human being. Where are you? Where are you? You need to realize where you are and see your need for him. 
And Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree that I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, the woman that you gave to me with me, she gave me the tree and I did eat. So Adam bl blames Eve. And the Lord God said to the woman, who is, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I did eat. She blames the serpent. We all do that, huh? Blame the blame game. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle, the beast of the field upon your belly shall you go, dust shall you eat all the days of your life. So the animal kingdom now is affected by this. I will put enmity. Here's the first promise of salvation and a redeemer coming to help us. I will put enmity between you, the serpent and the woman and between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise or crush your head, and you shall bruise his heel. God prophesies about the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, who would crush the serpent's head at the cross. Now we're talking about the cross. And even though Satan crushed his heel, he attacked Jesus's body. He killed Jesus's body, yet Jesus in his death was going to crush the serpent's head, crush the authority of the devil, of Satan himself, and uh, set up this enmity between Jesus and Satan, between mankind and serpents and mankind and demonic influences. Then he, multi he, he, he says to the woman, your, your sorrow and your conception is multiplied in, in sorrow and labor. You're going to bring forth children. Your desire will be to your husband. He will rule over you. Adam, he says, because you've hearkened to your wife and eaten of the tree, uh, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shall you eat of it all the days of life. Now, the God didn't say, I'm cursing the ground. That's not what he said. He said, cursed is the ground for your sake. Can, may I tell you something? Adam cursed the earth not God. Adam did. Who had authority over the earth? Adam. Who was given the earth? Adam. Who was supposed to have power over the earth? Adam. Who was supposed to do what he would with the earth? Adam. And he did, except he did it wrong. Very, made a big mistake, big error. The ground is cursed because of Adam. And that's why in sorrow, we eat of it all the days of our life. Um, Thorns and thistles it'll bring forth to thee. Thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of your face shall you eat bread till you return unto the ground. For out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. This is the story of Genesis, the story of the fall of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve's temptation, their sin, their unbelief. What was their sin? What was their mistake? They didn't believe God. They didn't trust what God said. They didn't believe his warning. They chose instead to believe something of this world, a snake, a serpent. Are we going to believe God and his word? Or are we going to believe what the world says? That's the issue. They're naked. They're ashamed. They're attempting in some human way to cover their shame. They're blaming one another. Earth is cursed. Again, not by God, but by Adam. I don't know if you realize this or not, but the earth has been greatly and negatively affected by mankind's sin, Adam's sin. Uh, this may be a little aside, but I want to explain something while we're talking about this, because the Bible does have all the answers. Uh, I, I, I hope you understand that the earth, the ecosystem, nature has been negatively affected by Adam's sin. I've got a friend, a relatively new friend, a minister up in New England by the name of Troy J. Adams. I'm sorry, Edwards. Troy J. Edwards. I'm sorry. I've got Adam on my brain. Troy Edwards, uh, a brilliant author. He's authored several books. In fact, I've got some of them on my desk. He's, I recommend him. You can find him on Amazon as well. Troy J. Edwards. Uh, you can find him on Facebook. Here's a book that he's written on, Does God Send a Sickness? Uh, here's another one, The Wrath of God, What It Is and How It's Executed. Nobody hardly understands uh, really about the wrath of God, what it actually means. The permissive sense, hence 
and helps to Bible interpretation that vindicates God's character of love. Wonderful books uh, that I've added to my library. I want to read to you a little bit out of his book, Does God Send Natural Disasters? Because he makes the point in his book that uh, natural disasters, see, we tend to think, people have taught us that if a hurricane comes, God hurl that hurricane at us, and God strikes us with lightning, and, and God sent a hurricane to New Orleans because they're so sinful, and, and God sends storms, and God does this, and God, God does that. And yet, in the New Testament, we see Jesus rebuking a storm. If God had sent that storm on the sea that day, Jesus would have been rebuking his own father. Well, what about, what about natural disasters? Is God sending them? Well, what's happening there? And so let me read to you uh, a quote from Brother Adam, uh, Brother Edwards. He says, many people do not understand how their actions affect the environment around them for good or for ill. Therefore, God gets the blame for all that happens as a result of our sin. It is our sins that destroy the earth and makes it sick. He quotes this scripture, Leviticus 18 verses 24 and 25. Listen to this. Defile not yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you, and the land is defiled. Therefore, I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomits out her inhabitants. In other words, when you have difficulty with the land you're trying to work and live on, and it gives you problems. It's your own sin is, is the problem. Listen to this from the Common English Bible, Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Look to the well-traveled and, uh, paths and see. Where haven't you committed adultery? On the roadsides, you sit in wait for lovers. God's rebuking his people here. Like a nomad in the wilderness, you have corrupted the land with your cheap and reckless behavior. That's why the showers have failed and the spring rains have ceased. Still, you act like a brazen prostitute who refuses to blush. Wow. There's all kinds of statements like this throughout scripture that show us that there's a connection between man's sinfulness and uh, the terrible upheaval and the terrible disasters and storms and and problems that we see in our natural world uh, he makes this statement on another page sin not only affects us personally but it affects the environment around us interesting which brings me to something that the apostle paul wrote in romans think about this romans 8 verse 19 he says, for the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God for the creation. He's talking about the, the earth. The creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption. Paul says that our creation is corrupt but it's going to be delivered from that bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Listen, don't blame God for disease or disasters or COVID-19 or hurricanes. Blame us, blame Adam. You say, yeah, it's that Adam and Eve that they, they, they sinned. And now there's a curse upon the earth itself. Well, that's right. But make no mistake. You and I have committed the very same sin that Adam and Eve committed. Every one of us have lacked trust in God. Every one of us have exercised unbelief in what God has told us at one point or another. Every single one of us has withheld from God. Uh, I pastored for 40 years, and uh, there were times I would be teaching on the principle of the tithe, tithes and offerings and giving to God. And I pointed this out to people. I'll repeat it tonight. You see, what God was actually saying to Adam is, all the other trees in the garden and all around the world, you can have those. Those are yours. But this tree is special. Don't eat of this tree. This tree is dedicated to me. This is your worship of me Adam this is what you're to give me give me back this one tree 
Now I'll say this. If you've ever decided, chosen, there's that word choose. If you've ever decided to not tithe, you've committed the very same sin that Adam committed. If you've ever decided to withhold anything from God, you've committed the same sin. Well, you say, Pastor David, we've all done that exactly right. That's why we all need a savior It's because we've all sinned against God. We can't just blame Adam. Adam was the fountainhead of humanity. Adam set the stage, but we've all followed in his footsteps. I'm pleased to tell you there's a savior though. He can save us from our sins and he can begin to work in our lives. And one of these days, did you know there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth? Did you know that even the earth is going to have a rebirth? That's right. This planet is going to be born again because of the grace of God and the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. Jesus came not only to save you and I from our sins, but to save us unto a great destiny, to salvage our pleasure, to save our planet, to save our existence, to give us goodness and life and blessing forever forever. I want to read to you from Romans, the third chapter. I want to just develop this thought of everyone's sinfulness a little more. You know, the fun, our fundamentalist friends are so good at preaching on this. A lot of times they don't agree with us on a lot of things. They're, most of them are cessationists. They don't believe there's any gifts of the spirit or miracles for today. So they don't, they're not much on teaching those things, but boy, they, they, they will hammer this home. And, uh, to tell you the truth, we're a little bit light on these verses in the charismatic world, and we need not to be. We need to understand what God has said about our sinfulness without Jesus. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 3, verse 10. He said, it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that does good. No, not one. There's that word good. Nobody really does altogether good. Their throat is an open grave. Their tongues have used deceit. The poison of asps, a poisonous snakes, it's behind their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. The way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that what things the law says, it says to them who are under the law, and that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. He lays out the case that the whole world is guilty before God. All of us have sinned. All of us have broken God's laws. All of us have failed to trust him and to believe his word. All of us have ignored the warning of God and taken the challenge of the devil and gone our own way. All of us have done that. And that's why all of us needed God's mercy. All of us needed God's compassion. All of us needed God's love so much. Just like God came to the garden chasing after Adam that day. Adam, where are you? I want you to know he came again in the person of Jesus. God became a man born of a virgin a man that lived his 33-year life with no sin. He never committed any sin. He was always, always doing his Father's will. He never withheld anything from God the Father. Jesus of Nazareth came into this world and showed us God. Jesus is called the last Adam over the New Testament. Why? Because he came to undo what the first Adam did. He came to reverse the curse, (laughs) to bring us out of cursing into blessing, out of death into life, out of evil and into goodness. He came to salvage mankind. He came to salvage creation. He came to salvage God's dream. Oh, please listen to this tonight. Jesus came to save God's dream. And God's dream is you. You, partners with God. You, children of God, you walking with God. God loves us so much. The Bible says he loved us so much. He gave us his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. 
Jesus came preaching, the Bible says, good news. Uh, now, we're not too far from the end. We're getting to the cross, but you got to understand these things, these things to understand the cross. Before we get to the cross, may I, may I share with you what Jesus came saying? It's so powerful. It's so revealing of the heart of God. It, it's, so, it's so filled with God's mercy. Listen, listen to this. Mark chapter one, verse 14. After John the Baptist was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel, the good news, good news, there's that word good, preaching, announcing the good news of the kingdom of God. What was his message? The kingdom of God. A lot of us preachers, we talk a lot about Paul and Paul's writings. Maybe a few, a, a few of us talk about Jesus enough, but very few of us talk about what Jesus talked about. I want to read you the, the words of the very first sermon Jesus preached. It was a, it was a beautiful, powerful four-point four point sermon. It's chapter 1 of Mark, verse 15. Here's what Jesus said. This is, this is Jesus preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He said, number one, the time is fulfilled. Number two, the kingdom of God is at hand. Number three, repent ye. And number four, believe the good news. Four-point sermon. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, believe the gospel. Let me break that down for you. The time is fulfilled. What time? What fulfillment of what time? Well, the Jews had been expecting their Messiah. They'd been waiting on their Redeemer, waiting on this prophet that was to come like Moses, waiting on the one that was going to set them free. Now they're looking for political freedom, but Jesus came to set them free spiritually, mentally, physically, and naturally in this natural world. That, and he's, he's saying the time is fulfilled. In other words, the time is now. In other words, waiting is over. Now God has come. Now, now everything can change. Now death can be abolished. Evil can be defeated. Now, now cursing can be done away with. Death can be vanquished. Now the time is fulfilled. Secondly, the kingdom of God is at hand. What does that mean? Well, these books are at hand. I can pick them up anytime I want to right there at hand. They're within my reach. He was saying the kingdom of God is within your reach. Anytime you want to now, you can reach out and take hold of the kingdom of God. You can press into the kingdom of God. By the word, by the way, the, what is the kingdom of God? The word kingdom, Strong's Concordance says it means three things, rule, realm, royalty. Anytime you want to, you can move into the rule of God. We need him to rule our lives. We'll see what a mess we make when he doesn't rule our lives. Anytime we want to, we can press into the realm of God, the world of God, the sphere of God, the presence of God, God's realm now is available to us and royalty. Wow. We become children of the King. We become royalty. We can partake of his royalty. Listen, we're created to reign, not rebel. We're created to be like God, to spread God likeness all through the world. And Jesus is saying the time, listen, I've come waiting is over. The time is now. And all of this rule of God, the realm of God, the royalty of God. In other words, let's say, let me say it a different way. Everything God is, everything God has, everything God can do, everything God can give, it's available to you right now. You say, Pastor David, that's great. How do I get it? That's the other two points he made. Repent, change your thinking, change the way you view things, change your opinion of God, change your opinion of the devil. Change your opinion of sin. It's an enemy. It's a disease. It's not your friend. It's not a, your favorite, supposed to be your favorite pastime. It's, 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 it's a killer. Change your mind about sin. Or let me say it this way. Change your mind about good and evil. Do away with evil and go for the good. Change your mind about life and death. Death is not to be embraced. Life is to be lived. Change your mind about blessing and cursing. Don't do the things that bring cursing any longer. Let's choose to do the things that are going to bring blessing. He says, repent. And then finally, number four, point number four, simple. Believe the good news. 
What is the good news? The good news is that right now, everything God is, is available to you. Yeah, we're going to get a thinking straight and we're going to believe that good news that God is here now. He's not way off in heaven somewhere. He's right here. Closer than your breath. Right here. Ready to enter our hearts. Right here. Ready to heal our bodies. Right here. Ready to provide for us. Right here. Ready to bless us. All we have to do is turn. Repentance is a turning away from that which was killing us and cursing us and turning toward this God that loves us and wants to bless us. Yeah. Oh, that sounds good, Pastor David. So I can be blessed. I, I, I can be good. I can have God in my life. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Because Jesus, after he promised us these, these promises, then he did what was necessary to provide it for us. How could goodness be restored to evil people? Well, it can't. How can blessing be restored to someone who's cursed? Well, it can't. It can't just by the flip of a coin, just because we say, no, take that. no, there was something else needed. No, no, something had to happen for death to be abolished, for sin to be vanquished, for cursing to be done away. What had to happen? Well, God had to come and he had already decreed that death would take us over if we sinned. But then he loved us so much that he decided to get in between us and death. God became a man. Man had to die. A man had to die. But a sinless man could die for everyone. That's the way God's economy works. And we see then the heart of the Bible explains to us what Jesus was accomplishing on the cross. Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah prophesied, predicted exactly what the Messiah would do so that you and I could have life, blessing, and goodness in our lives. He says in Isaiah 53, who, who has believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Notice that the arm of the Lord, that's his power, is revealed to those that believe. For he, talking about a person, shall grow up before him as a tender plant. I believe he's talking about the Son of God growing up before the Father as a tender plant, as a root out of a dry ground. He, he has no a root out of a dry ground. Jesus growing up righteous and holy and good in the midst of death and cursing and evil. That's a root, a living root out of a dry ground. Isn't that wonderful? Seed of the woman. She was a sinner. Yeah, Mary was a sinner, but yet Jesus, the son of God, birthed from her womb in righteousness. He goes on to say he has no form nor comeliness. When we see him, there's no beauty that we should desire. He looked like a regular guy. He wasn't necessarily a movie star looking person. In fact, he was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. We hid our faces from him. He was despised. We esteemed him not. People hated him, despised him, ignored him. We didn't think anything. Of, in other words, the human race didn't think he was anything special. Oh, how we missed it. Then he goes on to say in verse four, surely though he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. God became a man and he began to, to carry our sorrow and lift and our grief to bear our grief. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. We thought that when he died, that God had smote him. You know, anytime there's something bad happens, people say, it's all God. God did that. God did that. We, th we thought God struck him down because he was a false prophet or something. That's, that's what was going around in Jerusalem when Jesus died. That's not true. No, he says then, Isaiah said, I'm going to tell you why he died. But he says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was pierced for our transgressions. He suffered those physical wounds in his body on the cross because of our committed sins. He goes on to say he was bruised for our iniquities. Bruising is, is an inward bleeding. A bruise is bleeding on the inside. That's what iniquity is. It's sin on the inside. It's that bend towards sin. You see, Jesus bled on the outside of his body for our outward commission of sin. He also bled on the inside of his body for our inward perversity and iniquity and our bend and our tendency towards sin. 
that sin nature we talk about. Then the chastening of our peace was upon him. That word peace is shalom. That means peace with your enemies and it means prosperity and provision. And with his stripes, we are healed. Wow. Because his body was broken and striped and torn. Our bodies can be healed literally knit together and mended. Uh, This is not the only reference to healing. In verse four, he said, surely he has borne our griefs. That word griefs literally means sicknesses. He's carried our sorrows, which means literally pains. Literally, Isaiah said, he has lifted our sicknesses and he's carried away our pains. And also by the stripes, those mutilations and tears and of his flesh that that were laid upon by by the Roman scourge, the whip, by that we're knit together. And we're healed. And so we see that Jesus did something about our sins. He did something about our sin nature. He did something about the enmity between us and God. He did something about providing for us at the cross. He did something about healing our sick bodies. Then he says this, all we like sheep have gone astray. We've all gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord, the father has laid on him, the son, the iniquity of us all. In other words, All of our sinfulness, all of our curse, all of our death, all of our evil landed upon Jesus on the cross. He didn't die one death. He died billions of deaths. Oh, yeah. He suffered under all of our deaths. He was oppressed. He was afflicted, but he opened not his mouth. He was like a lamb brought to the slaughter, like a sheep before her shearers is speechless. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment who shall declare his generation. For he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. Was he stricken for the transgression of my people? Notice that God still claims sinners as his people he created us and he says jesus was stricken for his people for you and for me wow well what really happened at the cross at the cross the last adam undid if you will reversed what the first adam did to the human race at the cross jesus saved us from evil yes from our sins from cursing. Yes, now we can be blessed from death. That's right. Death is not totally put down yet. One of these days will be a resurrection of all of our bodies. We'll all live in a new heaven and a new earth. But remember, that was not the principal death that Adam uh, endured. God said the day you eat of that fruit, that day you will die. Well, he didn't die till hundreds of years later physically, but he died on the inside. That's why we as human beings are dead on the inside, deadened to God, separated from God on the inside. That's why we must be born again. Adam, who was created as a son of God, like God in the likeness of God, because he committed sin, brought death into his spirit. And now all of us have fallen prey to evil's demands and temptations All of us have sinned, as we read in the scripture. All of us have committed the very same sin Adam did. And all of us needed a redeemer. We needed another man, a sinless man, to take our place, to become our substitute, to die in our name. That's what Jesus did. On the cross, Jesus became our savior because you and I belonged on the cross. You and I earned crucifixion you and i earned death the wages of sin is death yeah that was our wage for our sinfulness but the bible says romans 6 23 but the gift of god is eternal life through jesus christ our lord jesus abolishes death for everyone who repents and believes the gospel, changes their thinking, and believes the good news. Yeah, that right now, God and everything God is, is available to me.
right now I can have God in my life. Right now I can be saved from my sin. I can be reconnected to God. I can walk with God. And now the transformation and the God likeness can begin to happen in my life. Incrementally, it'll take a while. God will let us grow. We're born again on the inside. And then we learn to follow him, trust him, love him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. That is the gospel of the cross of Jesus Christ. Wow. Uh, uh, I, I, I took a, quite a bit of time tonight to lay out the foundation, but I hope that it was worth it to you to understand a little bit more about what actually the Bible teaches us. That's the story of the Bible. I've hit the high tops. Maybe hit a few sidebars, but I've hit the high tops. And I, and I want to encourage you. I know most everybody listening tonight to this, uh, to this Zoom meeting and this uh, telecast. I know most of you are Christians, but there might be someone listening to us right now who says, Pastor David, I, I, I'm not really done that. I've not really changed my thinking toward God. And stop blaming God for all this and understand that I'm creating my own problems and I'm, I'm sinful and I need a savior. And uh, I really would like God to come into my life. He can do it right now. All you've got to do is turn away from that sin in your heart. That doesn't mean that you'll not make any mistakes from now. And it just means your attitude is toward God, not towards sin. You don't see sin now as your friend. You see it as an enemy and you see God as your friend. So turn toward God, and I want to ask you to do this. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says if you'll do that, you'll be saved. What do we believe? We believe that what he said was true, that right now he brings God to us. Right now, the good news is you can take hold of God because he poured out blood for you. He died in your place, in your name, in your stead. He became your substitute. He took your punishment. His body was ripped to shreds because of your sin and mine. Believe that, that his sacrifice saves you, that he took your place, that when he said, if you'll come to me, I will in no way cast you out, that that's the truth. Believe it and make him your Lord and Savior right now. You can do it with a simple prayer. Just pray this prayer with me right now. Everybody just repeat it right out loud with me, right there in your heart right there with your lips, say it right out loud. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe what I heard tonight. I believe the message of the good news. I believe God, you're a good God. And so Lord, I turn away from my sin and I turn toward you. I'm sorry I've sinned, but I want you in my life. And so I take you, Jesus, I receive you, Jesus, as my one and only Lord and Savior. That's right. You're my Savior. I trust you to save me right now. Cleanse me right now. Wash my sin away with your precious blood right now. Jesus, you're coming into my heart. I'm yours and you're mine. And from this day forward, my intention is to follow you. That's right. To follow him, friend. This is not just a prayer and then you're good. Go do what you want to. No, 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 no. This is a commitment that we trust him. And now we're going to walk with him through the garden like God used to walk with Adam. We're going to walk with him and hear his voice. We're going to walk with him and be blessed. We're going to walk with him and live. We're going to walk with him and let him put his goodness in us. The Bible says right now, as you pray. He's putting his goodness in you. I believe that. Say it with me. Your goodness, Lord, is coming into me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Fred, I want to turn it back to you, let you comment here. And and yes, we'll pray for the sick too in a moment, but I didn't want to take away from the gospel and people understanding their salvation and have an opportunity to take care of that if they have not done so. Oh, David, I appreciate it. I uh, hope everybody was, uh, you know, cued in. If in and it, it's always, the gospel is always good to hear over and over again. It should renew you and restore you. If you're a believer, it should just um, well you up with faith that you would want to proclaim it and tell somebody else about it. 
And so it's important for us to know about these things. I especially like, David, the, um, <clears throat> the journey that you took and wound up at Isaiah 53, because Isaiah 53, the, the gospel writers point back to Isaiah 53 as being the gospel. Yes. Um, that's Isaiah bef well before Christ, writing about Christ and us looking back. And one place it says, you know, that our stripes were healed and are healed. And some people talk about that being a discrepancy. No, it's not a discrepancy. That's exactly the picture of looking from those two directions. Yes. And uh, the goodness of God is what leads men to repentance. I love the way David brought that into full focus. It's God loves you. He is a God of love. In fact, the scriptures say God is love. That's what he, that's not, not, that's not what he does. That's who he is. That's what he's made out of. He, he is so full of love for you that he did all of these things to set you in place. I do hope you tonight you've been uh, quickened in your spirit and in your heart. Uh, Pastor David, I, we just so much appreciate what you, um, what you put forth tonight. That's awesome. Um, you can catch the rerun if you've missed some of it. Uh, if you can go back and take those notes uh, after the fact. I just want to remind you, if you're touched in your heart, you made that decision that Pastor David won, uh, asked you to make tonight. I want you to call that number, 806-338-2929, and just share that good news with somebody online. Let them pray for you and encourage you, and uh, we can even send you some information Um we're not trying to get check marks on our Bible or anything. We, we're, we're trying to build the kingdom of God. And Pastor David uh, made that presentation fully to you. Now. You know, that's how we get everything from God is we exchange what we have for what God has. And when we, when we get born again, we exchange our sin for his goodness and his mercy and his grace and we receive what he has rather than what we deserve. Mm -hmm. And so well put tonight, Pastor David. We, uh, man, I just thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for um, taking the time really to expand and, and uh, the liberty uh, to teach the fullness of the gospel tonight. We appreciate you very much. Thank you. Um, I would encourage everybody to go to his website, uh, check out what he's doing and, and uh, be in the midst of him. Um, I didn't mention his the name of the church that he pastored in Amarillo, Texas for many years, his Victories uh, Church. And uh, unfortunately, we lost a couple of, um, of former pastors to that church uh, in recent years. And so uh, Pastor David is 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 really the only one that remains that I know of, uh, except for the new guy that has uh, kind of taken his place now. And so uh, it, I believe he's, there's been a name change at the church, and he's a great guy too. I don't know him personally, but he's, uh, I know some of the pastors are with him and under him, and he's, he's evidently a, a great guy of the Lord as well. Um, but anyway, I just uh, encourage you to um, check back, keep check, checking back with us right here every Thursday night. We're going to have somebody that will encourage you and bless you and build you up and, and, and present the gospel, share the gospel, share the good news, share what's on their heart. And so uh, for tonight, uh, again, we just thank you, Pastor David, and we appreciate the time that you spent with us tonight, and uh, we just bless you and your ministry. Let me pray for you and your ministry, as well as uh, the people that have received from you tonight. Father, in Jesus' mighty name, I just pray that the presence of the Lord would just encompass everyone that uh, heard the preaching and teaching tonight, that, Father, that we would drink in, we would digest, we would um, allow the filling of the Spirit, our Spirit, with the Word of God, the truth of God, that, Father, that would set us free, that, that truth that we're intimate with, Father, it always sets us free. And so, Father, just help. Uh, I, I thank you for a blessing. I pray blessings over Pastor David, his ministry, and his outreach. And so, Father, I just uh, speak um, 
blessing and anointing upon his books that he's written and the teachings that he has available to everybody that father that they would draw all men into you father and i thank you for that healing ministry that he has father i just thank you that as he lays hands on the sick they do recover as you have given all of us that ability and so father i just thank you for the for the faith that's been stirred up I thank you that we can see ourselves as sons and daughters of God Most High and joint heirs with Jesus Christ tonight. And so, Father, we just thank you and we speak blessings into every life that's watched tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thanks again, Pastor David, and we just appreciate you so much. Uh, we're going to sign off. Do you have something that you would like to close with? Thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, join us again next week. Um, my goodness, you wouldn't want to miss out on something like tonight. <laughs> In Jesus' name, bye-bye. If you enjoyed the show today, be sure and get the download and the uh, show notes that we have available for you. If you agree that this is place to be, invite your friends. Use those little buttons to uh, connect us to your Facebook friends and others. And if you have not subscribed, do it today. Check out our free downloads. This is the Fred Hughes Show, signing off.